Turn with me to uh, Psalm 91. And it's a psalm uh, that is uh, well loved. It's actually one of the most uh, well loved of the psalms. It's one that uh, my I wasn't as familiar with uh, as some some folks are, and it really piggybacks uh, piggybacks on last week. Last week we looked at the certainty of God's uh, promises, and it was in a text uh, that ultimately traces us to Christ and His incarnation and His being King on David's throne. And so we're going to actually revisit Psalm 89 come Christmas time just because of its connection to uh, the fulfilled work of Christ and coming for us and, and uh, ultimately dying for us on the cross. But this psalm is a, a psalm that uh, doesn't, is, is quite a bit different. It actually threw me for a loop uh, a bit. Psalm 89 was one of praise mixed with uh, deep lament and grief. And that I get. Um, uh, but when I come to Psalms, such as Psalm 91, which are all positive, that sometimes uh, rattles me a little bit because the balance that was, I found in Psalm 89, I find I'm, I'm much more able to connect with. And so when I come to a passage like the one we're looking at today, when it's, all, when it's as positive as an enthusiastic as it is, I, I have all these uh, sort of little objections that pop into my head, and so I've been wrestling with the text this week, and maybe you have too, and, and that's a good exercise for us. When you and I read scripture and feel uncomfortable, that's a good spot to be in, uh, and we need to, we, and the call is persist with it, wrestle with God's word, pray about it, and, and do as much re work and research as you can. Just don't move on, uh, get into the battle, and, and, and see about how the Lord might change your thoughts and perspective. And so I've been having that sort of interesting little engagement this past week. And, and Psalm 91, uh, it is a psalm that overflows with enthusiasm and confidence in God and in his fatherly love. It has been a source of strength uh, for uh, countless generations of, of saints. It has inspired many to face their fears with confidence and it's a psalm that details for us the extent and degrees of God's protection for those who love him. And so let's have a look at it, and then we're going to look at some principles that come from this text. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. So as I mentioned, uh, it's... It's been a, it is a psalm that has uh, encouraged countless uh, believers. But it's also a song that this week I was wrestling with because it, it doesn't have the, the balance that the other psalms have, where they are full of praise and thanksgiving while also pouring out some of the, the struggles of life that they're in the, in, the, in the despair that they're going through. And this psalm just goes the, all the one way. And it gives, but it, does, uh, but it does so for a reason. And so that's why I want to invite you to walk with me through the text. It is a psalm, as I said, that, that depicts to us uh, a heavenly father who loves us. 
and who protects us and whose hand is upon us for blessing. And, uh, and in itself, that is a uh, great message for us. And so when, I, when I've been wrestling through this psalm this week, one of the takeaway points is, is that we have a heavenly father who loves and cares for us more than we can imagine. That is one of the points that is through and through this text. We have a God who loves us and who cares for us, a heavenly father, and it's, and it's beyond our imagination. When we think about this, we think about God who in, in love sent his son to die for us while we were yet sinners. We, we think we have a heavenly father who invites us to cast all of our cares upon him, who has said to us that he will never leave us or forsake us. Uh, he invites us as his beloved sons and daughters to come and rest under his wings. Uh, who per- is in the psalm, God has said to protect us from dangers and unseen attacks of the evil one. He's, we have a heavenly father who provides for our physical needs. We have a heavenly father who does not reject us when we sin against him. We have a heavenly father who notes the injustices done against us and who says, I will repay, I will ensure that justice is done. Uh, we also have a heavenly father who commissions his angels to come to our aid. And we have a heavenly father who, if it be his will, can deliver us from any situation. And so when, we, when I look at this passage, one of the things I take away is, is that good message that we have a heavenly father who loves us more than we can imagine. That's what we're, what we're to, one of the things we're to draw from it. Secondly, um, we, ha- we have the, the primary message of the text is to be a follower of God is to come under his protection. You know, sometimes uh, people will invest in um, alarm force or some security company where your house will be monitored uh, and uh, if only they get there within 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> you know, alarm force, they'll be there on the scene. I think they say the average thief, what takes about three minutes to go through your house or something like that. So uh, we may be wasting our money. It's better to buy a giant dog. <laughs> and, uh, as, but then when we have giant dogs, we, we want them to be friendly, so that might not. Uh, <laughs> actually, you only need a little dog. Most people are afraid of even little tiny dogs. Except for Sydney's little thing that's like looks like a rat. <laughs> uh, but the point is, is we we think a lot about our security. We think about the security of our computers. We think about the security of our homes. We think about locking our car doors and house doors and all these things. And yet, one of the the, the pictures that's given to us in Psalm 91 is that to be a follower of God is to come under His protection. God loves us so much, he says, you know, I, I am your, protect, your protector, I'm your fortress, I'm your shield. I found a neat, uh, this picture is by uh, Britton Riviere, and I've always liked it. It's the picture of Daniel in the lion's den, and how God shut their mouths uh, and protected Daniel from the plots of those that wanted to get rid of him because of his faith. The end result was that Daniel was elevated yet again within the kingdom and served under four Babylonian um, uh, emperors as number two in the land. And so God, nothing's impossible for God. When God has, God's plans always come to pass uh, and and no plan of Satan can can thwart the good and holy plans of God. But when we think about the protection, this Psalm walks us through different aspects uh, of God's protection. It talks about being protected. Now some of the language you and I are like, what is that? The fowler's snare. Well, if we lived in another country or we lived a few years ago, we, we talk, you know, trapping of birds, people that lay out these little, little nooses to catch birds or nets to catch birds. Uh, and uh, we don't do it so much unless you're a hunter up north. Uh, the, uh, it's not something we're familiar with in the city. But, but God talks about protecting from those who wish, wish to trap and enslave and destroy. Protection from deadly pestilence is is mentioned in verse 3. Shielded by God, covered by God, um, delivered from the terrors of the night. You and I have a lot of problems in our sleep, don't we? (laughs) Uh, And uh, so, you know, that's the first thing when we think of the terrors of the night, we think about the bad dreams that we sometimes wrestle with, but also is the fact that, you know, to uh, lay down at night, and and we live in a a country that we have a lot of of, uh, peace, that we don't know, uh, that in other places where you don't know what band of robbers is coming for you in, in the night. 
And that's not really a, a, a day to day concern that we have, but it is all over the world. Uh, and, and it talks about God's protection upon, upon his saints. Uh, the arrow that flies by day, um, safe from plagues that destroy. Uh, that's another thing that you and I are blessed with. You know, we, we lived through SARS about 10 or 15 years ago uh, when everything was on high alert about that respiratory illness that, was, that killed some people. Well, last year there was the talk about Ebola that was, that was contained. Uh, but by and large, uh, we, we know nothing about the plagues that, that's being spoken of here. I was reading the com- uh, some older s- commentaries from Psalms, and they routinely mention, like, Char- and I'll read an extract from Charles Spurgeon in a, in a minute, but uh, entire towns were depopulated. Entire families died because of plague. Entire countries were decimated by plague. And it happened countless times over the centuries where disease born by um, uncleanliness, by rats, uh, by uh, water pollution, and, and entire populations would die because of plague. Uh, and so when we think about, well, that's not, we don't, that's when, so when we read about protected from plague, you know, think about uh, the, the saints uh, and, and, and what they went through and lived through. And, and here's a, a scripture of confidence about God's protection upon them. And, uh, and so that's, that's another passage. Um, the plague that destroys at midnight, it talks about God's judgment and protected from God's judgments. It talks about uh, making the Lord's uh, one's refuge. And then even it's in God protecting from wild animals. The protection he supplies by sending his angels. The Bible speaks about how angels are God's ministering servants sent to help us. And so this is a passage, when we think about it, it, it sort of says, you have a heavenly father who loves you more than you can imagine. And, and at, in, in having such a heavenly father, he is about, he, he is working to protect you from harm. That's the message that's given. And so the, the, the thing that you and I wrestle with is, we say, but what about when that happened? And what about when this happened? And, and we, we interject our objections, uh, but we also have to step back and say, okay, what is, there are things that are seen and unseen, uh, and God is, God is working as his children. We are precious to him, and his hand of protection is upon us. Uh, and, and the point is, is there's, there's nothing that God can't deliver you from, whether it's disease or an enemy uh, disaster. Uh, if God so deems to, to, to pluck you out, then nothing can stop God from doing that. Uh, that's God has all the power in the world, uh, and it's at his disposal. Now, the third point is, is this, the promise of God's protection, which is real and eternal, that's the other thing that we should talk about, is it's not just protection in this life, but when one becomes a child of God, it talks about uh, being sealed for the day of redemption, how we belong to the Lord forever, and that Christ is gone to prepare a place for us. But the promise of God's protection, it does come with a couple caveats, and that's where uh, I want us to think about for a moment. First off is um, in the text it says in verse 1, what does it say? He or she who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. It talks about a person who's made a decision, doesn't it? A person who's made a decision to follow God and who's seeking his face. And so this, this promise of protection, God says it, it belongs specifically to people who have been reconciled to God. And that's where uh, tying with what Marion said, remember Marion said, we're Christ's ambassadors. If you read in 2 Corinthians 5.20, what is the role, uh, the calling of every ambassador? is to implore people to be reconciled to God. That's our universal job as Christians, is to introduce people to Jesus and say, you know what, you, you need to get right with God. There is a, a day that is coming, a real day, a, a judgment day, and the only way to stand with confidence in the day of judgment is to stand in Christ Jesus. And God in his love sent Christ while we were yet sinners, and Christ died for us, and he took the punishment that we deserve. That's how you can have confidence in that day. And so we implore you, be reconciled to God. And we bring that message uh, uh, with, in love because we, we care about people just as much as God cares about us and sent his son to die for us. And so it says, the one who says in verse 2, 
I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and fortress, my God in whom I trust. And then in verse 9, seeing how it, it's, these promises belong to the children of God, it says, if you make the most high your dwelling. And then in verse 14, because he loves me, says the Lord. And so the, there's a, the conditionality of the, prom, the pr promise of God's protection has to, has to do with, are you right with God? You can't claim his protection if you're not his follower. And so to come under his wings and to come under, uh, under, under his protection is to say, you know what, I, I realize I need, to be, I need to be right with Christ. I need to get right with God. And that's the invitation of God. And the promise of God is that each one who confesses their sins and comes to Jesus in faith will re receive the gift of eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. It's a gift received. It's not something that you and I can earn. Salvation is, is given to those who ask in humbleness and in faith and with a repentant heart. And it's in Christ alone. The second aspect of thinking about the promises and protection of God is, is it has to do with, there's a very important uh, thing that we have to put into our thinking is, is four little words, thy will be done. So here we have a passage where it gives this all-encompassing picture of the protecting power of God. And then you and I say, well, that means I'm bulletproof, right? <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> um, if God wants you to be bulletproof, you will be. <laughs> but, if, if God, but, but God also says, you know, there is a plan that I'm working out, a big plan for the redemption of people, for the salvation of, of people. Uh, and, and there is sin in the world. Um, and, and I can pluck you out of anything. And I've shown it, I've done it many times uh, but you, you also have to realize that there's that factor of what is my will for your life? Uh, and sometimes to glorify God, we go through deep and dark valleys, uh, the shadow of death. And, and which is part of in that mysterious big picture of God and, and him working for the salvation of people. That's why God says, my ways are not your ways. They're higher than your ways. Romans 8, which is a verse that we all have a, this we really wrestle with, but it it's, ties in. Um, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. It's hard truth, but it, it, does add an, it does add a proper perspective to a passage which says, here's the protections of God, and you and I, you, you, like I said, all, all the forces of God are for us, uh, and, and yet sometimes things come our way and we're like, what happened to God's protection? I, I claimed that verse. I memorized that verse. And actually, I want to challenge you to memorize some of these verses uh, because of their great comfort and the strength of God to overcome our fears and to face anything in the name of Jesus. But also saying, you know what? Sometimes for the sake of God's kingdom, things will happen in my life. And that doesn't mean that God's failed. It, it means that God is working working for his, the advancement of his kingdom, and I'm, I wanna, I'm glad to be part of it, even though it's, it, the, it's hard for me, but to see it in the bigger picture. God is working at, at, in, in all things because he loves us, but he's advancing his kingdom. And, and his, so there's that balance that we have to bring to the table. I wanna also talk, uh, share with you about how many a saint, and that's our next point, um, we're almost done. Many a saint has appropriated or laid claim, and this is where we have to be careful in our theology. When we say that promise is for me, then we then if things don't, and if but if God's will is something else for us, that we don't drop our faith. We need to hold on to our faith, having the bigger picture in mind. But many a saint has, uh, by faith, laid claim to the promises of Psalm 91. Charles Spurgeon, some of you have heard me mention him. He was a famous preacher in the 1800s in England. His church, uh, just uh, an amazing working of God uh, and, and the, uh, the a revival that happened there and God used Spurgeon, not because Spurgeon was great, just because Spurgeon had said yes to God and that's all God ever asks of all of us. Say yes to him and pursue holiness and watch what God will do. And always remember it's not you, it's God working. Uh, and so don't take God's credit, always give God the glory. Uh, in, and, and, and he wrote a big commentary, a wonderful commentary on the Psalms. In verse 9 and 10, this is what he says. Before expounding these verses, 
I cannot refrain from recording a personal incident illustrating their power to soothe the heart when they are applied by the Holy Spirit. In the year 1854, when I had scarcely been in London 12 months, so he was in his 20s at the time, the neighborhood in which I labored was visited by Asiatic cholera, and my congregation suffered from its inroads. Family after family summoned me to the bedside of the smitten, and almost every day I was called to visit the grave. I gave myself up with the youthful ardor to the visitation of the sick, and I was sent from, from all corners of the district by persons of all ranks and religions, and I became weary in body and sick at heart. My friends seemed to be falling one by one, and I felt, or fancied, that I was sickening like those around me. A little more work and weeping would have laid me low amongst the rest. I felt that my burden was heavier than I could bear, and I was ready to sink under it. Now, as God would have it, I was returning mournfully home from a funeral when my curiosity led me to read a piece of paper which was wafered up in a shoemaker's window in the Dover Road. It did not look like a trade announcement, nor was it, for it bore in a good, bold handwriting of these words. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is thy, my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Upon reading this, the effect upon my heart was immediate. Faith appropriated the passage as her own. I felt secure, refreshed with girt with immortality, and I went on with my visitation of the dying in a calm and peaceful spirit. I felt no fear of evil, and I suffered no harm. The providence which moved the tradesmen to place those verses in the window I gratefully acknowledge, and in remembrance of its marvelous power I adore the Lord my God. The psalmist in these verses assures the man who dwells in God that he shall be secure. Though faith claims no merit of its own, yet the Lord rewards it wherever he sees it. He who makes God his refuge shall find him a refuge, and he who dwells in God shall find his dwelling protected. And so over the centuries and over the decades, when people have happened upon these verses and said, God has, has led people to lay hold of the promises that are in this passage. Charles Spurgeon, at the end of his rope, just at the beginning of his ministry, a church decimated by this plague. What does he see? He sees a, a, what appears to be just a random verse, but it's not a random verse. Uh, and it, it enabled him to have the strength to carry on in a difficult time. And you and I are to lay hold of the promises of God committing ourselves to his will, his glory, but saying, you know what? I have a heavenly father who loves me more than I can imagine. Christ has gone to prepare a place for me. There's work to be done. God's hand of protection is upon me, and, and, and thy will be done. The last point I want to draw your attention to is this passage, and like many, uh, most of the scriptures, all of them seem to point us to Jesus, don't they? And this passage does the very same thing. And this is going to be our last point is it connects us to Jesus. Uh, some of you may have noticed how it connected. It connects in verse 11 and 12. It says about God's protection, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways so that they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. The devil knows the word of God. And in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus had, it, it records to us that Jesus, before his public ministry, had spent a period of time of fasting for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And it records that Satan came to him to tempt him and to test him. And, and one of the temptations that Satan says is he says it in verse uh, 5 and se to 7 of Matthew chapter 4, it says, The devil took Jesus to the holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the, of the temple. And this is what Satan said to Jesus. He said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Uh, Jesus didn't need to prove to Satan that he was the son of God. Satan already knew that. Uh, Jesus demonstrated by his many miracles that he indeed was the Son of God and the Savior and the one to whom we must follow for eternal life. 
Uh, and yet Satan was, he was, he was tempting Christ. Why, was Je- why is Jesus qualified to act as our Savior? Because he lived a perfect, sinless life. He said to no to all temptation and, and died as a once-for-all sacrifice for our sins. And so here we see the devil trying to mess things up yet again. He knows the scriptures. Jesus knows the scriptures. Satan twists the scriptures. Jesus properly interprets it. It's also kind of interesting that Jesus shows the limits of, of the intentions of the text. Satan says, you can do whatever you want because you love the Lord. And he's just, you, you throw yourself down and he'll, he'll catch you and protect you. And Jesus says, there's a, limit to the, there's a limit to be understood here. You're not supposed to put God to the test. Uh, you know, God can indeed send it and does send his angels to protect but not, it doesn't apply to foolhardy behavior. And so Christ interprets the text. What does he, how does he interpret it? He interprets scripture with scripture, doesn't he? And you and I, when we're trying to understand God's word, let scripture interpret scripture. Uh, and we need to know the word of God. But it shows us here, how, what does our, our text do wonderfully? It takes us to Jesus. And what does text after text do in the, in the scriptures? Wherever you find our, ourselves in the Bible, where is it always taking us? It's always taking us to Christ. Uh, because it's all about Jesus. Uh, without Christ, there's no eternal life. There's no forgiveness of sins. For our, uh, and, and, and so we're always being drawn to our Savior. And the, the, tech, the Word of God is always saying, look to Jesus Christ, your Savior, and give thanks and praise to God. He's worthy of it and follow Jesus Christ. That's why our texts always bring us to Christ somehow, some way. And here's this passage, and we see Jesus properly interpret it, but we also see the, the, we, we get that reminder that we, we need Jesus Christ in our lives. Uh, and, and God in his love sent Christ for us. And so, just a quick review. Uh, actually, the quick review is, what is it? We have a Heavenly Father who loves us more than we can imagine. Uh, God, uh, his, his hand of protection is upon us. As, as being a child of God, we come under the protection of God. There's a few things we have to understand. Uh, one, uh, God, while God can, can do anything and deliver us from any situation, we need to realize that God is working on a, has another big picture in mind. So sometimes things happen in our lives, but they happen for a reason. Sometimes we, we don't know why, and we might never know why. But, but it, building a good theology from the Word of God is important so that we don't twist scriptures and take them out of context. And so when you come to Psalm 91, it's meant to encourage us to give, cast all of our cares upon God, give all of our fears to God, realize that nothing is too hard for God. And, and to call upon God and say, God, I need your help and I need your protection. I need you to rescue me. That's what the psalm is trying to lead us to do. Take the focus off of ourselves and our resources and say, I need your help, and I know that you can do it. And, and, to, and to leave it there and to say, God, come and rescue me uh, and save me. And, and God says, I, I can do that, and I have done it. And, 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 and we just need to, we trust God about, and leave the end result to God because nothing is too hard for him. And I, would, I want to challenge you, and actually, we, uh, we have done well at learning our last memory verse. I've been scratching my head thinking, what, what is the next Bible verse that we need to learn together as a congregation? And, and we, uh, we, we've been putting into our minds that the fact that we have a Savior who's going to transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. That's, that's good for us to know that. Uh, that. That fixes our eyes on Jesus. Now I think our next verse is going to come out of Psalm 91. After thinking about how, you know, we have a God who loves us and whose, whose protection is upon us, we, let's, learn a scripture from, let's learn a scripture from Psalm 91. So I'm going to put that together as our next, uh, our next one of our next Bible verses is going to come from Psalm 91. But I encourage you to go back and revisit the chapter yourself and maybe put a verse or two around your house, on your desk, in, uh, or wherever it may be, just as a reminder of God's loving care for us. Let's stand together as we sing our closing song.